morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where on earth you're joining us today for our first ever Earth 300 Impact Talks. This is going to be our first episode, and today we're going to focus on a very special theme dealing with multidisciplinary initiatives and their impact on sustainability and climate change today. We have lined up 21 amazing speakers from you coming from all over the world who will be giving their three minutes intervention before I will ask my colleague Sarah Baikum, also from London, to give them targeted questions collected from our audiences. After that, I will be asking our founder and CEO of Earth 300, Alon Oruvera, who will give us a historical approach of where we are going in the next decade and what Earth 300 is all about. I'm very delighted to also share that Earth 300, Worldview Impact Foundation and Earth Bank are going to be working together with local communities in the Sundarbans of India to plant 300,000 trees this year with local partners, local donors and local corporates in India to restore the forests of the tide, hence creating a natural defense shield for communities living by the sea in the most high risk zones of the world from climate-induced storms and hurricanes and tsunamis and floods, thereby protecting livelihoods of the very poor and the most vulnerable in that part of India and Bangladesh, and also protecting the habitat of the Royal Bengal Tiger. We know there are only 3,500 tigers left in the wild, but 300 of them have adapted to the swamps, and they are called the swamp tigers. So I'm very honored to say that we are joining forces with Earth 300 and other partners to restore this very precious ecosystem, which is the largest mangrove forest on our planet. Having said that, I want to thank all our speakers who have contributed their time, their energies, their expertise, and he, they will be sharing their experiences, but also their challenges and their battle against climate change and addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by a target date of 2030. Having said that, again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board to our first episode, and I'm gonna give the floor to Aaron Oliveira. Thank you so much, and have a great conversation. Hello, friends, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the first installment of our Earth 300 Impact Talks. The kind of conversations we'll be having here today online are the kind of conversations that eventually we will be having about a 300 meter state-of-the-art exploration, innovation and scientific vessel on its way to Antarctica. Earth 300 was born out of a need to protect our planet, but really more accurately and more truthfully it was born out of a need to protect ourselves. Antonio Gutierrez, the United Nations Chief, recently stated that we're standing on the verge of climate abyss with extreme heat poised to cause more death, more destruction, and more displacement than all of the wars of history combined, the picture is not pretty. We need change, the monumental kind. We need to inspire an era of ecological imagining. We need to galvanize humanity to take big, bold leaps. We need everybody's help, and that's where multidisciplinarity comes in. Now, Leonardo da Vinci said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, but really nothing is that simple. In a single atom lies a complex labyrinth of structures and codes that drive and organize the entire universe. When an atom shakes, the whole universe vibrates. So really nothing is independent. Carl Sagan, the famous planetary scientist and cosmologist, uh, equipped that if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So multidisciplinarity is into everything that we do. And today you'll hear from an esteemed panel of experts and leaders in their fields of why they believe that holistic thinking and, and multidisciplinarity is essential in order for us to build a truly sustainable world. Um, now at Earth 300, this is the ethos that we believe in and we've been able and privileged to attract an incredible a talented pool of individuals, uh, so I'd like to thank our, our team who formed the DNA of our organization, our advisors who are spread all over the world and whose expert insights and faith have allowed us to get this far, our partners who have allowed us to technologically progress in terms of the project and, and, the, and the ship. Uh, design and, and all of the technical elements to it, the media which has been incredibly supportive. We've had articles in over 50 countries, um, the, the, the global population who have, has reached out to us um, and whose enthusiasm fuels us for the journey. 
Um, and finally, I'd like to also thank Sarah, Sarah huh? Begum, who will be moderating this panel, Bremley Is Lindo, who's chairing the, 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 uh, the session, and also Wakas Ahmed, who's our chief interdisciplinary officer, and he will talk about, we need, about how we need to move from multidisciplinarity to interdisciplinarity, which means that not only do different perspectives need to coexist, multi at the same time, but also we need to make new creations and new connections and pathways with those different disciplines coming together. As Steve Jobs said, creativity is simply connecting the dots. So I hope that these talks will inspire you to connect your own dots and we hope to, to continue to see you in the future and um, please join us for, for the talks and for the quest. Thank you. Hello and welcome from London, where I am live for the Earth 300 Impact Talks. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel with influential minds around the planet. Hello and thank you for having me on Earth 300's Impact Talks for 2021. Now, my name is Fabien Cousteau. Thanks, I'm guys. You're off. You're not live. An Thanks. ocean conservationist and a storyteller. I'm actually a third generation in my family in doing these things. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was speaking about strange things such as climate change as far back as the 1950s. Now, that said, I commend you all for looking at the multidisciplinary initiatives, their impact on sustainability and climate change for today. What I concentrate on is something very fundamentally important to these talks, which is the human ocean connection. Because without talking about the ocean, when we talk about sustainability and climate change, we are missing 99% of the picture. Our ocean is our life support system. It is what makes us possible. And without it, we cannot have constructive talks about living with the planet rather than on it. That human ocean connection is essential for us to make progress in living in symbiotic relationship with this liquid that connects us all and that makes this planet so unique amount amongst all the lifeless brown rocks floating in space. Now, for me, it's not fair to comment on other projects that I'm not associated with or I'm not heading. So let me share with you some examples that I'll pull from uh, our projects with my team and I who are working on it from, for example, the angle of the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center, which is a nonprofit. You know, our mantra is something my grandfather told me when I was a little boy, which is people protect what they love. And whether we use technology such as 3D printing to restore coral reefs so that we can bring in that youth curiosity, which is so vitally important for our future decision makers to be able to understand the complexities of our ocean world, or whether it's using an element of women empowerment in places like Nicaragua, where we can associate that and their needs along with the needs of sea turtle restoration so that we can protect our ocean planet. Those approaches are extraordinarily important. And of course, we have ambitious projects such as building the International Space Station of the Ocean called Proteus. And Project Proteus was born from an example of an expedition that I had at the world's only remaining laboratory called Aquarius where it opened up my eyes to the need for a better understanding and a better connection with our ocean world and our life support system. Because unless you peek below that blue veneer, and most of us will never get a chance to do so, we'll never get a chance to connect the vast majority of the people without connecting them through storytelling, through solution building, through implementation of ideas. You, are part of the solution. And without all the innovative ideas and all the implementation of those ideas, we will never be able to get into a space of sustainability, especially with regard to things like climate change. So I encourage all of you to do your part and push forward so that our future generations 
can take over and benefit from the things that we've taken for granted. Remember, people will protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. Thank you very much, and good luck on your impact talks. Hello. We painted on cave walls long before we had a common language. We painted, we sculpted, to record our history and to remind ourselves of that which made us the most human. Beauty, the aesthetic, nature. And it is art and culture, I believe, that is going to help propel us into the fourth conceptual age in which we try and find a more symbiotic relationship with our environment. My name is Dr. Jasmine Pradesito. I am an artist, a physicist, um, a polymath, I guess, but most importantly, I would call myself an accidental activist. I am an environmentalist, it has snuck up on me. And I've been delighted to have been asked to contribute this video for the 300 series in which we try to create an impact in our own individual ways. The material that I have been pioneering, well, I have not created the material, but I have been pioneering how to use it to sculpt for the last four years. And it's here in both of these sculptures behind me, sculptures that tell the type of story that I think art is very, very good at telling. It's only actually when something becomes personal, I believe, that we actually start to realise that we need to do something about it. And transformation can literally happen overnight. Five years ago or so, my son had a major asthma attack. That evening, lying in accident and emergency, it was the first time that I really started to think about the nature of the breath. I had never really considered it before. Before that, I was using my physics to work in discarded plastics and polarised light. And suddenly I felt compelled, utterly compelled, to start to tell a story about the things that we take most for granted. The things that sustain our being, and yet we bypass every day as we're so distracted and so busy. And strangely enough, a year later, serendipity being one of my favourite words, I was commissioned by Euston to create a sculpture of the second most polluted road in the country. And I created a sculpture called Breathe, but she's created out of a material not intended for sculpture, but it has one of the most amazing side effects. A three kilogram sculpture can absorb the NOx, the, the pollutant that is a byproduct of our progress, of our combustion, out of the air for approximately 60 years in an average size room. And so I have been pioneering this material, but to tell a story about what we're losing, how we need to change, so these two, one is called Sankofa and the other one is called The Bird Who Lost Its Song. I really do truly believe that it's not simply what artists create, but how we tell stories. The fact that we are systems thinkers, the fact that we can join many, many dots together that can create the innovations and the stories and the narratives to take us forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sebastian Copeland. I'm a polar explorer and a climate analyst and the founder of the Sedna Foundation. At the foundation, we explore the interconnection of uh, our various influences, uh, natural and, um, and human. And of course, we look at anthropogenic impact on biodiversity and uh, various ecosystems. The oceans um, display the same uh, concern um, that its land-based and atmospheric counterparts do, uh, specifically um, high levels of stress uh, leading to what is uh, most likely going to be a total collapse in some regions. Um, and of course, it does not have to be. We uh, could allow the oceans to be the powerful source of solutions that it is if we simply would let it. Uh, with multilateral agreements and policy enforcements, we can help nature do what it does best, and that is to regulate. And I think there are a few low-hanging fruits for that. Uh, one of them is um, essentially using ocean-based renewable energy. In Europe, we have 5,400 offshore uh, winter turbines that meet the growing energy needs of the continent. In the United States, we have exactly uh, seven. So that seems to me um, a, an easy target. Uh, offshore wind turbines are enabling countries like Denmark and Norway and other Scandinavian nation, nations to not just meet but exceed their energy targets for 2035 and 2050. 
Uh, another area at sea which could certainly reduce greatly emissions is transport with um, with the, the industrial um, uh, transport fleets um, by retooling uh, their energy needs to zero carbon fuels. And we have uh, presently that technology with a growing uh, development in hydrogen and ammonia and some biofuels. And we can certainly phase out the diesel and bunker oil uh, that is not just polluting the oceans themselves, but also the atmosphere. In terms of coastal and marine ecosystem management, there is an enormous potential with mangroves and salt marshes and seagrasses that store carbon and, um, and the seaweed that can be used for agriculture, that can be used for food, fuel and feed, and certainly reduce greatly the, uh, the land-based counterparts, which are energy intensive and uh, release a lot of carbon dioxide. And finally, we've got the fisheries and marine aquacultures and uh, the basically are meeting a dietary uh, needs uh, by shifting away from uh, land-based protein and more towards a less carbon intensive um, ocean counterpart. Uh, to that effect, however, there's a lot of uh, work to be done. Uh, for one, we absolutely need to empower the smaller fisheries. Uh, essentially, there's a local base uh, fishermen, there's about 125 to 130 million of them around the world that depend on fishing and mostly women in fact. Uh, but those, um, th those revenue sources are being threatened by the industrial fisheries, uh, fish, uh, the fishing fleets that is. Industrial fishing fleets that are being subsidized at the tune of $22 billion annually in public fund. And that needs to stop because these industrial fishing fleets are the ones that are doing the most damage, destroying the seabed and uh, all of its ability to replenish the marine food web. Um, and we need to stop lawlessness at sea, uh, enabling these fleets to, to go essentially unregulated and as well having profound violation of human rights and in many cases, just criminal activities that go um, unpunished. Um, the ocean climate connection is critical. Uh, we need to be connected to what the ocean has been doing to enable us to generate the, uh, the farming cycles that we've been benefiting for the most part of the last 12,000 years and on which we've defined our new modern farming techniques. Without ocean, without climate, we can no longer produce the amount of global calories needed to sustain ourselves as a species. And uh, the good news is we have solutions in hand. It's time to implement them. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Jeremy Gilliam, the founder of Peace One Day. Um, thank you, Earth 300, for inviting me to be a part of the Impact Talks. Amazing what you're all doing and feel very humbled and honored uh, to be involved. Uh, for the last 22 years, I've used storytelling to document the journey of the manifestation of a peace day, 21st of September, unanimously adopted by every member state. We've used storytelling to document what happened in Afghanistan, where there was a successful ceasefire, which led to 1.4 million children being vaccinated against polio. Any moment that we can give the combatants to pause, to think, and reflect on what they are doing to their own people and to the environment will be a great achievement and I will support it 100%. Uh, we've been documenting and creating events uh, using actors and musicians and all different sectors of society for many years now, um, which has led to about 1.4 billion people being fully aware of the day. Our target is 3 billion people aware of Peace Day by 2025. On the journey to 2025 to hit the 3 billion figure, uh, where people are fully aware of that day. Um, we have introduced some other shows. 21st of March, the day for the elimination of racial discrimination, we've partnered with OHCHR. Racism is a deeply rooted evil. It transcends generations and contaminates societies. It was very successful this year by using the kind of formula that we've honed for a long time. Uh, we're, we're able to reach a lot of people and, and it'd be amazing for anybody to, who's really interested in impact to go to peaceoneday.org and have a look at some of those figures. But climate action um, is, is crucial. No climate action, no peace. Everybody knows that that's the situation. So we created Climate Action Live on the 21st of June, um, taking the message uh, to many people around the world. I mean, we saw about 7 million impressions uh, around that period, about almost 800,000 engagements, uh, hashtag usage in every single country of the world and thousands watching live. So it's kind of, it's really interesting when we kind of look at these issues of diversity, inclusion, equality, justice climate action 
peace study and of course the mobilization of youth which we'll do later in the year as well as the peace day show and and, and 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 working in the way that we are we can really take the message out there in a big way because in the end it's all about narrative it's all about narrative it's all about informing people engaging people inspiring people to participate in the manifestation of a more peaceful and sustainable world and the one thing that we can all do to make that happen is to do exactly what earth 300 are doing right now which is putting out constructive messaging in the hope that it inspires people to action and that's amazing so well done earth 300 for everything that you're doing uh, i feel very humbled to have been asked and here's to peace one day co-founder and CEO of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations and businesses in 75 countries working towards a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is more than the ugliness of single-use plastics that wash up on our beaches. It is a human health crisis. Plastic pollution is an environmental and social justice issue which disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, indigenous communities, and frontline communities across the United States and around the world. Plastics are poisoning our bodies from the air we breathe to the water we drink to the food we grow and eat. On average, we each consume a credit card sized amount of plastics, microplastics, every week, every week. Carrying toxic chemicals such as carcinogens and endocrine disruptors believed to be changing human reproductive biology and linked to human health issues. Plastic is also contributing to the climate crisis. Every stage of the plastic life cycle emits greenhouse gases from extraction of fossil fuels to manufacturing, use, and disposal, which often involves burning plastics. There are over 350 million tons of plastic produced each year, of which 91% is not recycled. And we know that the goal needs to be less plastic, not more recycled plastic. But if industry has its way, plastic production is set to double in the next 20 years. Plastics will account for more than a third of the global growth of oil demand by 2030 and nearly half by 2050. More than trucks, aviation, and shipping combined. Scientists say we may be reaching an irreversible tipping point on plastic pollution. They say it could contribute to biodiversity loss in the ocean and disrupt the global carbon pump, which will exacerbate climate change. Clearly, we face an immense challenge. Plastic Pollution Coalition educates and connects people and groups to advocate for a world free of plastic pollution. We connect our coalition members to each other and partner with organizations and businesses to reduce the global plastic footprint. We advocate for legislative and policy solutions to change business as usual and stop plastic pollution. One of the ways in which Plastic Pollution Coalition has grown a global movement is by working at the nexus of science, art, and communication. To solve the plastic pollution problem, we need to envision a new way of doing things. Artists can imagine a different world, and by bringing that vision to life, we've begun to shift the system and move in that direction. Art can provoke a visceral response in people, which can be a powerful way of learning and being moved to act. And our phenomenal youth ambassadors are bringing the energy of a new generation into making the world free of plastic pollution a reality. We collaborate with musicians, actors, authors, filmmakers, chefs, surfers, and visual artists, and scientists, of course, who are looking at the plastic pollution issue and thinking about ways to communicate the problem and solutions. And there are incredible solutions and systems solutions to plastic pollution, many created by our coalition member groups and businesses. Non-toxic and reusable systems, refillable systems, which have been proven safe and are the future for the health of humans and the planet. Together we are moving in the right direction, away from fossil fuels, towards a non-toxic sustainable future. Each day puts us closer to a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution. 
Together, we are working to create a plastic pollution-free, climate-safe, and environmentally just world that we can proudly pass on to future generations. Scientists say we now have as little as six years to reroute the Titanic to keep global warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. While we are facing this significant challenge, we also celebrate the many solutions coming to life. We invite you to get more involved with us, Please visit our website to learn what you can do and to take action at plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marino Mejia Lopez. I am 15 years old and I live in Cotonou Island, Mexico. I am very concerned about the state of our planet, particularly with poverty and hunger, the destruction of ecosystems and species, the condition that means so much to me. We know climate change is a natural process but accelerated by human activities. So we need to take responsibility of that and multidisciplinary approaches are required to address its complexity. That is why I am carrying out two projects. First, aquaponics for my community, which is a sustainable alternative for food security and sustainable water management which teach families from vulnerable populations to produce their own food, while they protect the health of the soil, prevent contamination of the water table, and help people to have an economic livelihood by selling the food they grow. The second project is recycling mobile containers, consisting of mobile containers for the separation of solid waste there are always available in different parts of the island. So they contribute directly to the sustainable management of solid waste in Cosmo and allow the removal of waste of the island while the population runs and has some responsibility for its consumption. These projects start in 2017 in the context of a school, Montessori Pechio, where sustainable development and the SDGs are an integral part of our academic curriculum and are put into practice every day in our campus. We apply the scientific method to observe what happens in our community. So based on observation of real situations and scientific research, these initiatives start on the premise. What can I make for the well of my community? Then we design the way people could learn and act at the same time. Since island systems are so fragile, these projects contribute to their conservation based on the action of their own citizens. To present our projects at the Jewel Impact Forum of the Montessori Model United Nations has been key for us, as it is a platform whose methodology allows us to identify the stakeholders linked to these projects and improve the design of the projects for the large-scale launch based on the shared principles of rising our voices to take action and build peace. Exchanging experience with other adolescents and working hand by hand with social actors in a global multidisciplinary context exchanges us. Together we can do more. Hello everyone. My name is Festus Kiplagat, coming to you from the home of athletics champions. I am a chairman and founder to a Green Planet Initiative 2050. We are a grassroots uh, non-profit organization working with vulnerable communities, pastoralists, and forest dependent communities uh, to restore uh, degraded landscapes. Uh, we do this by improving the sustainability, productivity, equity, and profitability of agricultural landscapes through nature-based solutions. Uh, we co-create more productive and resilient landscapes and agricultural systems uh, while providing small-scale farmers, pastoralists, and forest-dependent communities with improved and diversified livelihoods uh, that fosters green rural economic growth. Climate change really and uh, land degradation uh, are threatening livelihoods, incomes and food security across sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in communities uh, which rely on 
rainfed agriculture, community forests, and pastoralism, uh, what they call agropastoralism. Land degradation, land use change, deforestation, and forest degradation represents 24% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally and are by far the main source of emissions in most African countries. This also has particularly uh, negative impact on ecosystem, goods, and services upon which communities rely, which ultimately undermines the resilience and adaptive capacity of these uh, populations in the face of climate change and now the pandemic. These impacts are compounded by unsustainable uh, uh, land use practices uh, that degrade the land. Climate resilience and land restoration is driven by healthy ecosystems, which are crucial to support poor and vulnerable communities that rely upon natural resources for their livelihoods. Reversing uh, land degradation and achieving sustainable land management are essential to addressing food insecurity rural poverty, and enhancing the resilience of forest-dependent communities. We are bottom-up in our approach. We create green movements, farmer to farmer, village to village, region to region spread of ecosystem restoration, working with women uh, to build resilient landscapes. Hi everyone, my name is Leander. I'm 20 years old. I am the co-founder and current CEO of 25100, located in Zurich, Switzerland and in Athens in Greece. Our mission is to empower the next generation to create future solutions through an intergenerational collaboration. Our aim is to provide and develop solutions for the 10 most pressing issues that we humans face. One of the most important things to us at 25100 is that we work cross generations because we believe that if we fight and always say that the older generations or the younger generations, they're not doing it right, we will not lead to anywhere. That means we as 25100 want to make sure that young people do have a seat at the table and decide about our future, how we will move forward, but also learn from cross generations and more experienced people in order to make the most and biggest impact that we can. Now, talking on multidisciplinary actions, it has been talked about since many, many years. And look where we are today. I think that it is definitely the solution to work towards more impact, but it will take a lot to be able to solve all the issues that we face in the world. Especially on climate change, we need to drastically change the way how we think, meaning how we work, how our economy is working. And we like to say always that we need to work towards an impact economy. An impact economy where sharing is above taking away from others, where greed and selfishness is not the driver. It is really about an impact economy where we thrive as humanity, wanting the best, wanting the most impact, and do things better from now on and change things for the mass, not only for the 1%. Now, talking on the level of climate change, it is definitely one of the most pressing issues that we're facing, meaning that it is at the top of our agenda. On climate change, we've asked ourselves the, the question, how can young people contribute the best? And we believe through action. And that's why we've called Klima into life. Klima is the first youth climate fund that provides capital to young individuals who have come up with ideas and technologies that change the way how we treat our climate, how our environment, and how we live on this planet. Now, 
with this climate fund, we don't only want to funnel money into IDs that you know, create and protect our environment, but actually have a business ID behind it as well. Because we want to actually make a statement that climate finance makes sense, can make revenue, but also at the same time create an impact that we can live with and not destroy our planet. We have realized that there is a lot of climate finance talks you know, coming up now. There's a lot of promises by big governmentals um, on big governmental levels. But where innovation actually happens is on the private sector, especially grassroots level, right? And this is where we come in. We really take ideas from the bottom up, see, evaluate them, and hopefully bring them to a stage where they're market ready. They can go out there and actually create what we've always said, an impact economy. And this is our way, how we want to contribute to what we call the impact economy. So thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to um, having the talks at um, Impact Talks at Earth 300 and connecting with like-minded people who are doing amazing things for our planet. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all our speakers from, you know, particularly representation from Africa and Latin America, who are our artists and activists. I really like the intervention they made on saving the oceans. And uh, now we're going to move to the question and answer session. And I'd also like to introduce our founder and CEO, uh, Aaron Oliveira. So over to you, Sarah. Let the questions and answers begin. Amazing. Thanks, Bradley. Hi, Aaron. It's great to see you on here. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a question from the audience for you. 7.7 billion potential contributors to saving the planet. How do you activate them and take complete advantage of all each one could contribute with? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Sarah. So essentially, I mean, this is a collective problem that we have, right? A global problem, and that's the ultimate goal is really to be able to affect every single person on the planet. Um, I think there's three aspects to that question. The first one is that we will be limited in terms of the technology deployment that exists in all the different countries and nations, because really only 1.5 billion people right now on the planet have access to the internet on, on a mobile phone. And the second part to that is that um, that's the reason why F300 has been designed as a scientific uh, sculpture for the oceans, you know, and for, for the world uh, to attract everybody's attention so that at least we have the chance to get people uh, plugging in and learning about the environment and about climate science. Um, and then the third component to that is being able to make sure that, you know, because we are a vessel that will go around the world, we can visit some of the coastal uh, countries, you know, like around the coast of Africa or Asia or South America, and we can also directly impact with talks uh, um, and, and on the ground, you know, but essentially through technology will be the ultimate goal in terms of affecting all of these people. Um, I, I see another question that's come in here in terms of the um, how, to, uh, how to be able to foster a collective stewardship. And I think that, again, it's all about being able to let people know globally what's really taking place um, uh, from an honest and transparent uh, perspective and what they can do to help, you know, so that we can indeed inspire collective authorship of our planet, you know, and really let people know what, what they can each do to, in, in their own little way, ways, right? You know, Sir so Francis Bacon said, you know, if you cannot uh, be the candle, you can be a mirror, you know, you can reflect the light. So really everybody will be able to participate at some level and our job will be really to push technology as much as possible and also to visit as many places as possible with our vessel. Amazing. Do you know how long that would take, the entire trip that you have planned? Um, well, I mean, it, it's really like uh, how long is a piece of string, right? I mean, we, the idea is really to uh, be circumnavigating the planet all the time um, and for example you know to circumnavigate Antarctica it's a 72 day, day journey to circumnavigate the coast of Africa would be possibly three months you know so it really depends but I believe that 
to be able to circumnavigate the entire planet and, and give each place its due cost, you know, and its due uh, merits, we, we would need from two to three years to do that. So by, by no means it's a small feat. I mean, it's a great challenge, but that's why we're here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Aaron. And um, over to Jasmine now. Uh, Jasmine, I love your work. So interesting. Wow. Um, I'd love to know what you mean by the fourth conceptual age. So, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's wonderful to be uh, amongst such company. So, good morning from London. Um, if you think one of the reasons that we're in the situation that we are is because of the various revolutions that we've had before, from agriculture to industrial to information. And um, the fourth, so most of that, though, was to do with rational, sort of fairly left-hand brain thinking, if you like. But as we enter an age in which automation, AI, machine learning, things will actually do an awful lot of that work for us, we have to reconsider what, what we bring to the story. And for me, obviously, I'm a utopian, well, my work kind of veers between the, the real dystopian and the utopian, but I like to imagine in a world in which people are freed not to have to do jobs that they wouldn't want to do, that they will be in a position to be able to, to kind of really explore the best of what it means to be human, and invariably the best of what it means to be human is to be connected to things. Uh, if you think, you know, to, you know, many thousands of years ago, we knew that we were simply a speck in the universe, and then, you know, during medieval times, we suddenly decided that we wanted to try and control nature, and we can see the effects that this had. But in the future, it has to be about symbiosis, and for me, the, the culture is, is one of the best things about what it is to be human. And we were drawing on cave walls many, many, many years before we could speak. We were recording our stories. Um, and again, it's, it's about narrative. Uh, there's a body of work I'm, I'm making at the moment called, you know, The Bird Who Lost Its Song. And it's not simply about animals that are no longer finding their spaces. It's about not listening to very, you know, very ancient practices that went before. We need to listen to we occupied space and land and so the conceptual Asia is very much about empathy storytelling meaning purpose and a lot of these things come through creativity and I believe that everyone in, I mean I do believe everyone has a talent so that's what I'm hoping that we can encourage that because when it becomes personal we take care of it it's very simple when it becomes personal we take care of it and that for me is where culture and creativity comes in so thank you I so love much that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jasmine. Now over to Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? Morning. Very well. Thank you. Um, so, Jeremy, how has Peace One Day transformed our perspectives of each other, despite our differences, and why is this important for humanity to absorb before we tackle any great problems of our time? Well, first of all, well done to Earth 300 for bringing everyone together and, and uh, uh, having this wonderful vision. I think what Jasmine just said is uh, absolutely right. I mean, for like for 22 years, I've been on the road, 133 countries, used a camera to, to tell a story, right, to see if we could make something happen. And there's people... Uh, at the 21st of September, we then used the camera to record what happened in Afghanistan with a successful season. I think what Jasmine just said is uh, absolutely right. I mean, for, like, for 22 years, I've been on the road, 133 countries. Um, uh, that to, piece day, it yeah, exists story, where we are. Right? You know, I think now what we want to do is kind of just uh, 21st of March, we introduced the High Commissioner of Human Rights, um, uh, the, the day for the elimination of racial discrimination. 21st of June, we just did a climate action show. For me, storytelling narrative is absolutely key. I mean, we've got, to, we've got to inform people, we've got to inspire people, and we've got to engage them. Those are the three things for me. Information. You know, inspiration leading to engagement. And that's why what Earth 300 is doing, you know, is so important. And I think that if we want to lift the level of consciousness around the fundamental issues that humanity faces, then those three things are going to be pivotal to us being able to survive and, and, and move forward. I mean, the show that we just did, you know, bringing artists and actors and thought leaders and environmentalists and, you know, business, the business world, Richard Branson, Paul Palmer, Mary Robinson, Michelle Bachelet, etc. You know, it was quite incredible, right? When you present this kind of activity, which we're doing four times a year, you know, there was almost 8, billion, 8 million impressions, 780,000 engagements. You know, I mean, this sort of work is touching, you know, millions of people. So for me, it's all about different sectors. It's all about presenting that in the hope that you can inform, engage, and inspire people, you know, to, to be kind of part of the shift that is absolutely fundamental to our survival. So, 
you know, I mean, look, there's so much I could say. People go to peaceoneday.org and find out more. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Earth 300 and everything that you're doing, well done, you know, because the more that we can send amazing messages out into the world, you know, the better chance we have of surviving. <laughs> Big ball of energy. <laughs> Just spreading the peace everywhere you go. I love it. Okay, thanks so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate that. Um, over to Leander. Hi, Leander. You're the youngest person on this panel. How are you? Yes. Hello. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. So it's great. It's so refreshing to hear from the future. You talk about the 10 most pressing issues that we humans face. I'm interested to find out what are the top three? Right. Uh, that's, a, that's a very hard one to actually define um, because I think it's a, a holistic um, approach towards parallel things that we need to solve in this world um, because sometimes you cannot solve the, the one without solving the other. Um, and, and climate change um, is one of the most pressing ones and I think is the, is the big tsunami behind what is happening actually in the world right now, behind COVID and whatsoever, right? Um, there's a very famous picture of um, climate change being the biggest problem in the world um, and, and coming up to China. Because right now in, um, in Switzerland, in Germany, we have huge flooding at the moment because um, this, it's been happening uh, that it's raining on normal, um, which has never happened. and over a thousand people are missing and have uh, died already in Germany, in Switzerland, where you would think uh, safety is quite high, right? So things are actually showing up more and more. And I believe, uh, speaking from a young perspective, um, what we want to try to do at 25100 with Klima together, being a fund that invests into entrepreneurial ideas, which I think is key to changing things, how we, we do things in the world, um, is that uh, we, we try to involve the young people because um, we're going to be on this planet very, for a very long time and, um, and, and we need to pass that on for generations and generations and we need to work together across generations. So pretty much what we're doing is we, um, we want to build up startups um, and, and companies that are successful in the future by, um, of course, being environmentally aware but also socially aware, because that is a very big, big part of, of um, thinking holistically. And um, the, the, the cool thing about Earth 300, which is so exciting to me, is because knowledge is the key to, to, to developing things, right? And uh, for me, Earth 300 is actually a tool to knowledge that we cannot think of today, right? And, and by uh, learning so much about especially the ocean, which is the, actually the lungs of our world um, and, and, and the lifeline of everything, right? Um, uh, I think I'm very, very excited to get to more in the future with Earth 300 in order to take that information and put it into entrepreneurial ideas that then can be developed and um, better the way how uh, shipping routes are um, done, um, the better the way how uh, we get uh, natural resources within the seas, etc. right? And um, there are some fascinating young people in this world that you don't know of yet, maybe, but um, they are, they are going to come there, and um, they're going to come with us. <laughs> well, and um, we are really, really hoping um, to succeed with that, um, and connecting especially with Experienced people like you uh, is, is key. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leander. You give me so much hope for the future. You know that. You give thank me you very so much. much thank you very much. I appreciate you and people like you. So thank you for what you're doing. I want to thank um, the speakers on the panel for this group. Thank you so much. It's been so interesting hearing your responses and answers. Um, and we are going to continue the session and play the last set of videos for the um, Policymakers. So, so thank you so much, everyone, all our activists yeah. and friends watching. Keep, keep keep the questions coming. So sorry we couldn't get through Festus. I think we lost him. He's yeah. there, but he can't hear us. Now we're going to move to the last panel, which is including practitioners and policymakers from around the world. And maybe if Festus comes back in the last round, we'll go for one more round of question and answers and break into a more of a discussion session. 
So let's play the last set of interventions from our policymakers and practitioners. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand on. <laughs> 